Dr. Sproul saw recently a national talk that he had uh, given, and he was commenting how when the staff puts together the schedule for a national conference, they always assigned him the last spot at the conference, so that he always had the last word at the conference. Well, I want to let him have the first word at this conference. He once said, I think the greatest weakness in the church today is that almost no one believes that God invests power in the Bible. Everyone is looking for power in a program, power in a technique, power in anything and everything except where God has placed it, His Word, that God has invested power in His Word. That is the topic of the sufficiency of Scripture. Uh, when we talk about Scripture, when theologians talk about Scripture, they speak of Scripture as having attributes. Just as we speak of the attributes of God, we speak of the attributes of Scripture. That first attribute of Scripture is authority. As the Puritans would say, we only need two words. Well, two words in Latin, four words in English. Dominus dixit, thus says the Lord. Uh, that is the basis of Scripture's authority, the doctrine of inspiration that God has divinely inspired, given us His Word. And as Warfield argued so succinctly and cogently, because it is God's Word, it does not err. And so because of inspiration, we have the doctrine of inerrancy and the infallibility of Scripture. That's the authority of Scripture. Theologians also speak of the necessity of Scripture. Because Scripture is authoritative, it is necessary. It is essential, not a luxury, not convenient, but essential. Uh, theologians also mention the word clarity, and sometimes they use the word perspicuity. And perspicuity is an unclear word to say clear. But we talk about how the gospel message is so simple and clear that even a child can understand it. The authority, the necessity, the clarity, and we add the sufficiency of Scripture. Now, I think there's a fifth attribute, the beauty of Scripture. This book contains the most beautiful literature ever penned the beauty of Scripture. But our task this morning and as we unfold it today together is the sufficiency of Scripture. And to give us a place to land, to begin, and to frame out this topic, I want to look at the endings of both 1 Peter chapter 1 and 2 Peter chapter 1. So we'll start with the ending of 1 Peter chapter 1. We will look at verses 22 to 25. We'll start with 1 Peter, we'll finish with 2 Peter. Verse 22, Peter paints for us an idyllic picture, and then he explains what is the basis and what enables this idyllic picture. At 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 22, having purified your souls by your obedience to the truth for a sincere brotherly love, love one another earnestly from a pure heart. Since you have been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable through the living and abiding Word of God. For all flesh is like grass, and all its glory like the flower of grass. The grass withers, and the flower falls, but the Word of the Lord remains forever. And this Word is the good news that was preached to you. 
When we go back into verse 22, we see this idyllic picture. Uh, this picture that we would all long to be true in our, in our families, in our churches, in our spheres of influence and in our relationships. This picture of a sincere, uh, not a fake, not a, a, a plastered on love, but a sincere love from a pure heart, from pure motives earnestly for one another. Uh, what a beautiful picture. Uh, this picture in verse 22 is something we all long for, isn't it? Uh, we think of the selfishness that ricochets through human relationship. We think of the wake of turbulence that is left after people who do not have a sincere love, who do not care about one another, who exercise their positions of power in ways that just rips lives apart. And that retaliatory vengeance culture that we just seem to be surrounded by. And Peter paints an entirely different picture, doesn't he, in verse 22. And it almost seems like it's Shangri-La. It's the adjectives that he keeps using to pour on what this community looks like. Does he have to say sincere? Does he have to say earnestly? Does he have to say pure? And the cumulative effect of all of that creates this, this environment, this place that we long to be part of. And it immediately raises the question, doesn't it? How is that possible? There's nothing like that in the world. Oh, there's the bands of brothers here and there. Right now, in Kansas City, the entire city is united. In San Francisco, the entire city is united. But just go to Green Bay. Just go to Nashville. The mood is different. We see pockets, moments but nothing at all like that describes. And it immediately raises the question, how is this possible? How does this happen? How does that description of verse 22 come about? And this is the bulk of what Peter goes on to explain. It happens because there is something divine at work. It happens because it is extra nos. This does not happen within the human beings and as we interact with each other. This takes divine agency and divine empowerment and a divine source. And that divine source is one thing, the Word of God. And this is what Peter goes on to explain in verses 23, 24, and 25. You can have that reality of verse 22 that seems so idyllic, you can have that reality because you have been born again. Because you are no longer the you you used to be and your sinful self, as Luther said, suffering from incurvitis. That self turned inward. But you now have been born again. And how have you been born again? Well, by a seed. And not a perishable seed, but a seed that is imperishable. And it is in the living and the abiding Word of God. That it is the Word of God that contains the gospel that then you heard that was preached to you that then enables this reality to come to pass. And Peter loves talking about the Word of God. He calls it living. The crown jewel of this building is right in front of me, the library. And I love walking into that library because I'd never met Augustine. And I've spent a lot of time with Jonathan Edwards, but I've never met him. And I'd love to have lunch with Luther, but that just never happened. But I can walk into that library and I can sit down and I can have a conversation with all of them. We love books, don't we? 
But even those great books by those godly men do not have this dynamic that Peter is talking about. That this book is unique. It alone is the living, abiding Word of God. We need to be reminded of that. Uh, We need to be reminded that because this is the living Word of God, it has the power, sharper than any two-edged sword. And if there was one thing a good soldier is responsible for, it is the responsibility of keeping their weapon ever ready. And these Roman soldiers made sure that every inch of that sword blade was razor sharp, forged of the finest material by the finest craftsmen, intimidating just to see it at a soldier's side. And yet the Word of God is sharper than a Roman soldier's double-edged sword, because it alone is the living Word of God. To get help, Peter turns to a few of his friends, and one of his friends is Isaiah. In verse 24, Peter takes us back to one of the most beautiful chapters in all of the Old Testament, Isaiah chapter 40. And it's absolutely fascinating to me that Peter takes us there. Do you remember where we are in Isaiah chapter 40? When Isaiah prophesies, he prophesies to a community that will be in exile. He is writing ahead of the destruction of Jerusalem to a community that will experience the destruction of Jerusalem, that will be taken prisoners and held captive in a foreign land, and someday God will return them. Now, let's put ourselves in their shoes for a moment. Tiny little Israel tiny little nation-state overtaken by mighty Babylon. And later, they are now under Cyrus, the Medes and the Persians. Much, much more than the rumbling of a steamroller. For a hundred miles, you could hear the Persian army coming as the march sent an earthquake in front of it of rumbling. And these Israelites are sitting around the fire, and they're hearing the words of Isaiah, chapter 40. Take a look at it with me. They're under the thumb of superpowers. Their nation was destroyed. Their capital city, rubble. Their temple, pile of blocks, and yet the prophet says, make straight a path through the wilderness. Deliverance is coming. Take a look at verse 6. A voice says, cry, and I said, what shall I cry? All flesh is grass, and all its beauty like the flower of the field. The grass withers, the flower fades when the breath of the Lord blows on it. Surely the people are grass. Do do you know who the people are that are grass? The great Babylonians, Cyrus, the great Medes and Persians. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the Word of our God will stand forever. And all of a sudden, the people of God in exile have steel in their spines. The message of deliverance is a promise they can bank on because it is the Word of God and there is nothing like it. Everything you see that you think is powerful and mighty and lasting and built for the ages will fade and fall away and wither and fail. 
but the Word of God remains. The Word of God remains because it alone is what God has invested with His power. So we come back to 1 Peter, but hold a finger there in Isaiah chapter 40, because Peter's not done with Isaiah chapter 40. So he quotes Isaiah for, in verse 24, all flesh is like grass, all its glory like the flower of grass. The grass withers, the flower falls, but the word of the Lord remains forever. That's the doctrine of the sufficiency of Scripture. It alone is sufficient because it alone has this promise connected to it. But then Peter says something very interesting. It's as if he he quotes Isaiah, and then he sets his pen down, and he just thinks for a moment of this audience, who he's writing to, who he is pastoring through this epistle. And he says, and this word, uh, this eternal and abiding and true word, this word, word is the good news that was preached to you. When we talk about the sufficiency of Scripture, we say two things. The Bible is sufficient. The Bible alone is sufficient for salvation. And the Bible alone is sufficient for sanctification. That's what we're talking about that God has provided us everything we need for life and godliness. That the only message of hope, the only light shining in a dark place is the gospel of Jesus Christ, and it is only found in His revealed Word. It is not some sincere faith that somebody exercises, that God is big enough to redirect to Himself. It is not some kernel of truth that may be present in a non-Christian religion. It is the Word of God that alone accomplishes salvation. But I think at verse 25, at the end, Peter is still thinking of Isaiah chapter 40. Let's go back. Go back to Isaiah chapter 40 and go to verse 9. Go on up on a high mountain. Now, you can't do that in the great state of Florida. (laughs) You can't do that. So you have to pretend you're somewhere else to understand what mountains are. Go on up to a high mountain, O Zion, herald of good news. Now, I know it's early, but we are in a college building, so I will give you a quiz. One question. What do heralds do? They herald. It's very simple. (laughs) They proclaim, don't they? They have that deep, sonorous, booming, George Whitfieldian, Stephen Lawsonian voice. (laughs) And what do they do with that booming voice? They shout out the news. And we all like to hear what? Good news. When when Peter says, and this word is the good news that was preached to you, he's thinking of verse 9. Get up on a high mountain, you herald, you preacher of good news. And here's the message you preach. Behold your God. And this is what Israel needed to hear when they were in exile, sitting around the campfire, under the thumb of a superpower, waiting to see God's promise fulfilled. They needed a herald. They needed a message preached to them. This is who God is. 
And now we come back to 1 Peter. And what does the herald preach? Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. This is the gospel that was preached to you. And without it, no, no being born again. And without that, no sincere love. And without that, no pure heart. And without that, no one another. It all comes back to this glorious message of salvation. And the only, the lights go off if somebody just walks back and forth, the light will come back on. The only message, I'm actually serious, if someone just walks back and forth, the light will come back on. The only message that will affect this salvation is the message of the gospel. And we have to believe that. And here's the other thing that sufficiency tells us. We have to believe in the necessity of the preaching of the gospel of Jesus Christ. There are any number of things the church can get caught up in doing, but the primary task that the church must do is get itself up on a high mountain and be a herald. And when pastors walk into the pulpit and they preach any other thing than the Word of God, they are, in the words of one of your books, giving a famine to the land. And they're holding back the nourishment of the living Word of God from the people of God. And when the church ceases to get up on a high mountain and say, Behold, Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God, who has come to take away the sins of the world. When we fall down in that task of proclaiming the gospel, they will not hear. And how can they believe if they do not hear? Paul made it very clear what was the obligation of the church. Salvation is found in no other name, and it is found in no other means than the heralding of the gospel. The Bible alone is sufficient for salvation, and it is the church's task to proclaim it, to believe it. And here's another thing. Have you met people that you think are outside of the pale of the gospel? But you don't want to admit it. You don't have to speak out. But there are times when we think, How could the gospel penetrate that cold, dark heart? And there might even be situations close to home, a relative, a friend, year upon year, decade upon decade of exposure to the gospel witness, and we lose heart, and we begin to wonder. And we always trust in the sovereignty of God. We always trust in the efficacious call. We always trust in God's sovereign, unconditional, free, divine election of souls unto salvation. But we also remember that God's Word will not return void. And you remember what he says back in Isaiah when he gives us that promise? It will accomplish exactly what it was set forth to do. In our growing weary, in our sometimes befuddlement of what we encounter, we must never lose sight of the power of the gospel, the efficacy of the gospel to accomplish God's purposes. It never fails. It never falls. It never falters. 
it never fails to rise to the occasion. Well, that's the end of 1 Peter chapter 1. The Bible is sufficient for salvation. The only means of salvation is the proclamation of the gospel as contained and as revealed in the Word of God. The Bible is also sufficient for sanctification. Take a look at 2 Peter and the ending of chapter 1 at verse 16. Peter is reminiscing of a remarkable moment in the incarnate life of Christ, the Mount of Transfiguration where the humanity of Christ was pulled back and the identity of His divine person in the word that Dr. Sproul would use, the refulgent splendor of the glory, the excellency, the majesty, the holiness of God was on display. Imagine experiencing that with Peter. It stuck with him. It stuck with him. Probably a day didn't go by when he remembered that moment. And he recalls it. But he does something very interesting with it. Let's take a look. Verse 16. For we did not follow cleverly devised myths. I want to come back to that. But we did not follow cleverly devised myths when we made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. But we were eyewitnesses of His majesty. For when He received honor and glory from God the Father, and the voice was borne to Him by the majestic glory, this is my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased. We ourselves heard this very voice born from heaven, for we were with Him on the holy mountain. Those two moments in the incarnation where God breaks in and declares who Jesus is at His baptism and at the Mount of Transfiguration, and Peter was there. And we had the prophetic word more fully confirmed. Now, if I were Peter, I might be tempted to say something like, and none of you will ever experience that. <laughs> and do you know what Peter could have done? He could have packaged his little seminar, his little secret to success in life seminar, and he could have trucked that little seminar all over and charged exorbitant fees, speaking in grand halls, to unlock the mystery of the meaning of life. Isn't this what we are surrounded with? The experiential. The, I have uh, found uh, the path to the top of the mountain, and I'm now the guru, and come learn my secret, seven secret tips of how you can find it too. Isn't that what people are surrounded with? Uh, there used to be a thing we watched called television. Do you remember that? <laughs> and, and there was late night television. Do you remember that? And it was full of people who had these seminars. Well, they've all migrated now and they have their own YouTube channel. So now you go to YouTube channels and it is full of gurus with the meaning of life, and they promise light. They promise enlightenment. They promise the secret. They promise the key to unlocking the mystery because they found it, and they've got it. Isn't this what we're surrounded with? And don't think just in terms of the charlatans. The philosophers did the same thing. Go back to the beginning of modern philosophy. What did they call it? Aufklärung. Enlightenment. And it started with Descartes. And it moved on through Locke. And it went to Hume. And it went to Immanuel Kant. 
the quest for enlightenment. And Kant writes an essay, uh, not in a philosophical journal, in a newspaper. Uh, what is enlightenment? We've all been kept in the dark. Uh, he says, we are mouthless, is the German. Mouthless. We are miners. Uh, not miners who dig in the ground. Miners with an O. Who have no legal standing. And so culturally, legally, have no voice. And so the German expression is mouthless. And we must come of age. We must find ourselves. We must be ourselves. And this isn't true of individuals, it's true culturally. For centuries, external authorities have exerted their influence and have kept us powerless. But now, through the exercise of human rationality, we can have enlightenment. And that's modern philosophy. Whether it's Descartes or Locke or Hume or Kant or Hegel. And they set the world on a trajectory to abandon God and to abandon this ancient book and to look for enlightenment within. Now, whether you're a philosopher or a charlatan, you're saying the same thing. And Peter could have done that. But look at what he does instead. And Peter's experience, by the way, was real and true. And he could have said, and I'm sorry, but you'll never get to experience that for yourself. So you'll just have to trust me that someday in heaven you'll experience the glory of God. And for now, just do the best you can. Now, you see what he says? And we have the prophetic word more fully confirmed. Uh, Peter doesn't say, don't think less because you won't have this subjective experience of the glory of God. In fact, we've got something more. We have the objective Word of God. We, wouldn't it be nice if every morning you put on your cup of coffee and God appeared. The glory of God brightened the room. Would that be enough for you to get through your day? Do you know what Peter says? You have the prophetic word more confirmed. You do have it. The power that is in this book. I don't know why, but it's true, that old adage, that those things that are sort of familiar to us can become contemptuous to us. I don't even know how many Bibles we have in our house. I have every single Bible Crossway publishes and every single edition of the Reformation Study Bible in my office and my home. <laughs> Is it the proximity to this book that causes us to forget sometimes what it really is? And what does Peter tell us to do? Two words. Pay attention. In fact, he says, you would do well. You, you would do well to pay attention. This is the first week of classes. Remember the first week when you were in college? I paid attention the first week. I listened to the syllabus. I listened to what the teacher said was important about, not what I thought was important about the syllabus. I was paying attention to what the teacher was saying because I was always looking for clues. And I had one professor in seminary who would always give us an exam, and he had a habit. On his way out the door, he would just drop some innocuous comment, 
But if you were paying attention, it was not innocuous. It was a little crumb that would lead you to the answer he was hoping you would give him. And so we learned that very early on, and we would all sort of pay attention to what he said as he walked out the door. That's what Peter's telling you to do. You get older, you need this. You need to do this. That's the image. Every time this book opens, we need to do this. Because this is the Word of God. And what is it? What is it? It is a light, a lamp, shining in a dark place. We've all been there. The hotel room that you wake up in the middle of the night and you have no idea where things are in the room and you walk right into the wall. We've all tried to navigate darkness unsuccessfully. And we know what it is to be a dark place. And just as sometimes we would never articulate it, but just as sometimes we can think, is, is the gospel message enough? Maybe the darkness is so over overwhelming we can wonder, is this book enough? Life is so complex and complicated in the 21st century. Is the Bible, is this ancient book enough? And here's a promise. It's a light, it's a lamp, and it's shining in a dark place. Oh, you can guarantee that first century Rome was a dark place. I guarantee you it was a dark place. The, the glory of Rome was probably already behind itself. And it was in the early stages of its barbarism that would overtake it. Was the first century a dark place? Absolutely. Is the 21st century a dark place? A complex place? A scary place? A confusing place? And the Word of God is a lamp shining in this dark place. Of course, he has Psalm 119, 105 in mind. This word that is a light unto our path and a lamp unto our feet. And we live in a world where there are all sorts of promises of lamps and lights. And people spend all kinds of money chasing after all kinds of gurus to find that solution and that meaning. And sometimes we as Christians even find ourselves erring from the path, don't we? And we run here to this thing, and we run there to that thing. And sitting right in front of us is the living and the abiding Word of God. Do you remember Christian in Pilgrim's Progress? Our friend Bunyan is laid to rest in Bunhill Fields. And sometime in the 1800s, there was put on top of his gravesite a statue of Christian, Bunyan's famous character. And there he is with a book in his hand, right smack dab in the center of London, with all of its activity and all of its static and all of its noise. And there is the lamp shining in a dark place. And we're Christian, and we've got our book in our hand. And that's the sufficiency of the Word of God. Let's pray together. Father God, You have given us such a gift, Your precious and very great promises. This book is a shining light in the darkness. Thank You for it. May we pay attention to it even as our Lord Jesus Himself taught us to do so. And in His name we pray, amen.